Today's episode of the Energy Newsbeat podcast is brought to you by Inveris. The energy industry faces massive challenges every day, and the events over the last two years have caused huge disruptions like never before. Companies in the energy industry need actionable intelligence and a single source of truth that brings all the data together. Inveris is the energy specialized technology partner that provides intelligent connections for a global energy ecosystem. Only Inveris has the analytics, people, experience, and industry scope to connect the right data and information information in the right way to discover missed opportunities and deliver fast outcomes. Find out more at Inveris.com. That's E-N-V-E-R-U-S dot com. Hey, everybody. I get to do something I love every day, and that is talk to folks that are in our uh, energy space. My name is Stu Turley, President and CEO of the Sandstone Group. I got somebody from Inveris stopping by the podcast today. I got Carson Curl. And I'm having to pronounce it like curling up in Canada because he's coming from Calgary today. Thank you, Carson, for stopping by. Thanks for having me, Stu. I'm excited to be here. Uh, I'll tell you, uh, what's kind of fun is I've interviewed several folks of your coworkers up there, and uh, that bar is set really low because of, uh, you know, this may be your first podcast. So yeah. if this is your first podcast out there, I was already in the pre-show messing with you a little bit. You want to tell us how that went? <laughs> I was moving my camera all over the place. I was doing sound checks. It was, it was lots of fun. Thanks, Stu. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Keep moving it up, moving it down. Uh, anyway, we had an absolute blast. And we're here to talk about the Trans Mountain uh, uh, Pipeline and other key plays that are like the oil sands and other things that uh, politically have happened uh, from the United States side, because we need Canadian oil bad and the rest of the world needs Canadian oil bad. So tell us about your report, because you guys just put out a heck of a report on this. Yeah, thanks, Stu. Um, so the report we put out is called the Canadian Oil Sands uh, Trans Mountain Expansion Key to Near-Term Production Growth. Yep. And it kind of focuses on how incremental takeaway is kind of the driver of production growth uh, from Canada and specifically the oil sands, you know, over the next seven or eight years to the end of 2030. Mm -hmm. And thank you or thanks to the incremental takeaway, we're going to expand probably by around 900,000 barrels a day over the next seven years. So around from 3.3 million a day today to 4.2 by 2030. Nice. Um, and it'll take around that long for us to fill this incremental takeaway um, in the Trans Mountain expansion, which is you know adding you know 600,000 barrels a day of takeaway to the Canadian market. Um, and that's you know heading to the Pacific Rim, California, Washington, and then you know Asia and kind of a lot of big markets that are going to be important for not only. Right us, but also the differential between CS and WTI. So the Trans Mountain starts in Edmonton and goes where? Yeah, so it starts in Edmonton, which is in Alberta, and it goes to Burnaby, BC, which is kind of a small, a smaller port town right on the edge of British Columbia and pretty close to the Washington border. How big are the uh, tankers that can come in? They, I, I don't know that they can get the, the large ones in, can they? Or can they? Uh, um, Historically, the takeaway to the region hasn't been enough to support the large tankers just because there isn't enough oil. But now that we have the extra 600, they'll be able to fill like a consistent schedule, um, which will be new for the region. Nice. So it's deep water enough that they can pull them in. Yeah. OK, great. Yeah, because I don't remember on any of the charts that I've seen. So I, I'm just trying to protect my fact check myself. I have to do that all the time. But I hadn't seen that on any of the charts or anything like that. So um, now when when we export out of that, the primary target is Asia. Is that correct? Um, the uh, Asia is one of the targets, but a lot of, you know, Canadian oil traditionally does flow down south towards, you know, what, like this will be the first Western coast connected pipeline that really serves Asia from Canada. Right. But it will be serving California and some of the West Coast uh, states as well. Oh, that's fabulous. I, I wish California would buy from Canada rather than China coming up out of the rainforest and killing the rainforest and not doing any good. So, yeah, it doesn't make a whole lot of sense to us down here. The uh, distaste for some Canadian oil that is present, you know. Now, there's a lot of, I, I visited with some other Inveris folks, and I just want to get this out there that I love Canada. 
I love uh, the fact that Canada has got some of the cleanest ESG friendly drilling out there. So why wouldn't we buy from Canada? Yeah, you know, it doesn't make a whole lot of sense to us that we're so close. We have the extra production to serve a lot of the U.S. market, especially like the heavy oil refineries in like the right. southern U.S., but it uh, just hasn't always worked out that way. Oh, no. Now, when we take a look, there's a big bad. This report involved the Trans Mountain and oil sands. Tell us about oil sands, because uh, you have... Uh, I can't even say the poor kid's name, the the actor who was in uh, uh, Titanic, you know, what it could look like. Oh, Leonardo DiCaprio? Yeah, he stood yeah. up there. Thank you. I, I can't even pronounce that. No uh, worries. I, I don't watch his stuff. But if he st I got pictures of him or I saw him on Twitter uh, where he was standing up there going, look how evil this is. The oil sands are not that bad, but we I, tell me about it because we need to understand that. Yeah, so one of the big differentiators that, you know, is important to take into consideration when thinking about the oil sands is the difference between surface mines and like wells, like seg D, which is essentially horizontal drilling. Um, right. And horizontal drill drilling has like, a, you know, relatively little environmental impact, impact, like on the scale of oil production in the world, it's, you know, among some of the best. Mm -hmm. um, and there are, you know, the rules in Canada are like very, very specific on the mine side about restoring the land um, to its previous condition when you're done with an area. And, you know, future growth wise, pretty much all of the growth in our production forecast comes from, you know, seg D well drilling and not additional mines. So that kind of the negative outlook on the mines, like, isn't something that we're having to worry about going forwards. And I and I'm being a little biased here because I love Canada, but I don't see anybody from China uh, recreating the rainforest down there. Uh, haven't seen anything, you know, on that. No, yeah, the you know the regulations and restrictions as to what you can and can't do from an environmental perspective are you know very strict in Canada. So the ESG portion of that Canada does take to heart. Now, how and how does Inveris educate people on this? You have the new ESG tools, you have all those things, and you're reporting. Uh, Carson, you know, your report is getting out there now. Um, I, I thought it was a good uh, good bunk, bunch of information. So what else are you guys coming around the corner on how you educate people on that stuff? Well, one of the, on the Canadian side, specifically with the oil sands, one of the biggest things we're going to be following and, you know, continuing to put out research on is how expected like federal government uh, environmental policy is going to affect kind of the landscape of the Canadian oil market going forward. So there's supposed to be right. a, like a very significant bill um, in the start of next year that right. could aim to cut, you know, like carbon emissions by up to 42% from 2019 levels. Um, so we will be following that very closely, but it is like we believe strongly that uh, the well, government of Canada will cooperate with the government of Alberta. Back up. Okay. 42 percent from the 2019 levels. Yeah, by 2030. All right, I got a crayon here, and I'm doing yeah. some math, and I, <laughs> that ain't math. Uh, I don't know what you can do on that. No, yeah. So that's that number specifically for the energy sector, um, you know, being like oil and gas uh, extraction, wow. excluding power burn. Um, essentially, the way that we're looking at it is that is that if you believe that those targets are going to be set and they're going to be, you know, fixed and you will have to meet them, then you need some right. form of carbon capture, which will require um, some co some cooperation between the federal and provincial government to kind of set that up and help the industry, you know, start down that path. But Alberta happens to be one of the best CCUS reservoirs or have some of the best CCUS reservoirs in North America. So it's definitely possible for us to continue down that road. When you take a look at carbon uh, utilization and storage, uh, man, that's uh, th that's fabulous. Hey, I just had a brilliant idea, Carson. Let's add this to your next report. What if we get ESG scores for Canada if we take every bit of uh, oil that California buys from Canada and use the tax, the credit, carbon credits coming out of the rainforest that you save for every acre you save that we buy from Canada, you guys need credit for that. 
I think that's a great idea. Yeah, I mean, we definitely, um, we definitely could, we definitely could use some help on the on the ESG carbon credit front here in terms of kind of what we are doing compared to some other places around the world in terms of trying our best to cut down emissions and oh, you know be environmentally friendly. I'm being a smart aleck, but it would be one way to get the great and various word out there that you know uh, we need to do. We need all energy. We need wind, solar. We need and yeah, all of it. We need all. I don't care. Uh, honestly, we just need the lowest cost energy to all the people, elevate them out of poverty without destroying the environment. Yeah. Um, and, and how did you get to Inveris? For sure. So prior to Inveris, I worked for like a small consulting firm in Alberta that did um, like hedging for electricity and natural gas contracts for the federal right. government. Okay. And that was like really cool and it you know helped me build a lot of the technical skills that I use today but my like I would the best part about school for me was like writing research and like learning about cool stuff that I like thought was interesting all the time and yeah. like Inveris is just the perfect place to do that and to you know be able to flex your your learning and your curiosity muscles on a daily basis as well as do fun stuff like talk to you guys and clients and right all that well I, that is actually very cool because the Inveris team has so many different product levels and different products. You got to be really sharp on everything coming back across all of these. You can't be just a uh, single lane individual working at Inveris. Yeah, there's lots of collaboration between all the teams. And but but that being said, at the same time, you know, there is a lot of help um, from everyone whenever you do not understand something about a product or an area of research. So it's, it's really nice to be here. Oh, that is cool. Now, uh, I, I'm weaving some things around here on you. So as a, as a first time podcast, I can sit here and pick on you. So I'm, I'm throwing this out there for everybody that we're having some, some serious fun and making you nervous. So you <laughs> get all nervous and everything. Don't worry about it. Not worried. Uh, uh, so when we take a look at uh, the Keystone, you know, that one just made me airsick, honestly. Uh, President Biden, uh, first day in office, cut it out. And it would, how many uh, uh, barrels per day would that thing be bringing in right now if it was online? Um, I think it would be around an incremental 800,000 barrels a day um, of capacity, which would take some time to fill um, from right. a production growth side. But, you know, that would be the, that would be the end amount. Yeah. Uh, I'm doing some crayon math here again, Carson. Let me think. Um, oh, that's almost what we uh, import from uh, Russia, you know, so. <laughs> yeah, and all those SPR releases too, those don't help. Oh, let's not get me started on that disaster. I mean, we're in a, a national security crisis right now. So I would love to have that Keystone on here. So, yeah, do you want to fly up with me and go talk to the administration? Because I'd love to. I mean, <laughs> I mean, yeah, it would be it would be super beneficial to Canada and it would, you know, open up a lot of room for America to import oil from Canada instead of other countries that, you know, might not be as right as now, official as us. So uh, we mentioned in Alberta going to the Edmonton area in there the ramp up time from the oil sands if we had the keystone you can't just turn on oil everybody thinks oh yeah start pumping how long would it take to get to that eight hundred thousand? well at the current pace of growth that we're forecasting it's going to take about uh, about the next six ish years to fill the trans mountain expansion right so so adding the keystone would essentially double the runway of about 135 thousand barrels a year year over year right. of growth it was, so we'd have a, essentially 12 14 years instead of six to seven if we added the keystone you know i'm doing some more math uh again uh, i went to oklahoma state so math is kind of tough you know it's <laughs> just but thinking of the growth for the money for alberta and uh the money to canada is huge I yeah mean, if you take a look at ESG friendly, cutting energy costs, that's a lot of money, even by my standards. I mean, yeah, I mean, with, you know, oil prices the way they have been this year, the Alberta, like which is my province's government, 
you know, ran like, I think it was over a $10 billion budget surplus, um, which was totally unexpected at the beginning of the year. So right. it's definitely made a big impact. So, and Alberta is the largest uh, contributor to the overall Canada Canadian budget, if I remember right, because Canada's got these little ways that they give money back to the regular government in, in that. So they contribute big bucks to Canada. So you yeah. would think that, you know, if you want to get another aircraft carrier, it'd be nice to get some money in there. It would be. It would definitely be beneficial, not only financially to the province, but financially to the nation. So uh, as we take a look, what's your next project that you're working on now? Because that one, and I'm sorry, one thing about Inveris, you guys never stop, you never sleep. No. You don't take a lunch break. You don't do anything. So what's coming around? What is your next report you're working on? Um, on this topic specifically, the next report we put out will probably be addressing the federal regulation that's supposed to arrive in early 2023 from the Canadian government. Um, right. Otherwise, right now, I'm I'm on the macro team. So looking at like largely like global trends, we're talking about, you know, Russia, OPEC, all that kind of stuff right now is, you know, very topical. OK, a uh, uh, couple things. Do you have any inside baseball? What they think they may uh, it. This is not curling like on the ice where you have to do all that uh, baseballs where they stand. I'm just kidding. OK, so uh, what do you think politically could be? That was a bad joke, wasn't it, Carson? That was anyway i played hockey You've done better so far but it was good OK, but when I may have that cut out, I'll have to ask. We'll we'll wait and see. But when we uh, we take a look, what do you think the political environment may have an effect on that legislation? We take a look at the uh, Internet, the uh, Inflation Reduction Act had nothing to do with inflation reduction, but it does do a lot of things for uh, energy storage and some other things and nothing for oil and gas. So do you have any inside baseball on what that's going to happen? I mean, the I mean, the policy, like I said, that we're expecting in spring of next year, we we do expect to be sort of Canada's answer to the IRA. Okay. Um, so it'll be it'll encompass more than just like emissions targets and reduction targets. We expect it to try and be a little bit competitive to the U.S. in terms of, you know, inviting investment dollars into the country. Um, okay. because it's pretty uncompetitive when you look at all of the ground that was broke with the IRA. It's pretty much like the global standard now for government policy on a clean oh. energy perspective. Um, in fact, there was an article just this week that went out and said the uh, United, uh, the EU and the UK are upset at Biden because now they got to start coughing up money. So you hit the nail right there. It's like everybody's like, oh, no, now we got to you know go through. Yeah, that. now we have to compete. <laughs> but that's a good thing it is I mean, in in some ways um so we take a look at at, at that and, and when we look at also russia and we have opec we have the opec meeting next week what are your thoughts on that yeah so the opec meeting was was switched to virtual from in person Right. Um, recently. And that's because we largely think that they're going to kind of hold off, um, you know, making any swift decisions to see what happens with Russia as the EU and the North American kind of G7 bans and sanctions right. on the exports come into play. Um, so while, the, you know, they could hold an emergency meeting later on or right. their next meeting, whenever it is, I think in the beginning of next year, we'll probably see a decision. But for right now, the, we just think they're going to sit back and watch to see what happens with the market. So you're thinking minor cut or made just status quo? Uh, for this meeting in December 5th, right. uh, status quo. They're, it went to virtual. I don't think they're going to make any decision um, then without seeing how, you know, because Russia could come off over a million barrels a day with the sanctions. And if that's the case, then OPEC might not need to cut. So we'll have to see how the market balances after that. That's excellent. Um, I have folks from both sides saying, you know, it's it's kind of like a yelling match. It's going up, it's going down. Uh, yeah. You know, I I almost feel like I'm at a World Cup so soccer match. Let's see. <laughs> um, yeah, no, it's, it's a very volatile, very interesting time to be in the energy market right now. Um, it It is. Now, in is it February when they start uh, imposing sanctions on diesel or any refined products? 
Yeah, so December 5th is crude only, and then February will be all products from Russia as well. That's It's going to hurt the U.S. northeastern section bad, if I understood my crayon math again, because there's already a diesel shortage over in that area over there. And if you're going to, right now, Russia is taking its crude, I believe, from Russia to Sicily. Sicily is then um, refining it, and it then it's going to uh, the East Coast as diesel. So, I mean, I'm sitting here kind of going, all right, that's that may still stay there because, you know, they're going to forget to write down where it came from. Um, but it's still going to be a big problem for the markets, don't you think? Yeah, I can't speak to the to the specifics about the root of the product or anything <laughs> like that. I don't I don't know enough on the subject, but broadly, you know, we have seen a diesel shortage and diesel prices have been elevated for the last little while. So if right. you know the product exports from Russia, we're losing our diesel, you know, that says something about you know continued tightness into next year for sure. Right. And on the refineries, uh, I was reading a report that they're like 99% capacity and they've not been taking maintenance time down. Have you guys talked about that as a part of the formula? Because that's, uh, again, I have to remember what I read, but that's a huge number because all it takes is one burp of a refinery and we're into even some higher prices. Sorry, which uh, were the refineries where are you are you specifically talking about or just, just broadly, uh, globally? It just broadly and globally. I mean, it's not a specific, but it was an article that I was reading and saying that they're run, they skip some of their maintenance runs and they skip some things. So uh, I guess my question is the market is so tight. We could even have any manufacturer, any refining blip, uh, anything, and it's just going to drive it right on through the roof. So, I mean, you guys are watching the supply side. Yeah, one. I mean, on the refinery front, one of the things that we do talk about in this report is specific to the U.S. I don't know enough about the global situation to, to speak to that. Okay. But one one interesting theme was that the water levels on the Mississippi River were fairly low for a while throughout oh, yeah. the summer. And that was kind of limiting barge takeaway from refineries to take those refined products back to the rest of the U.S. So we know that was having an impact on a lot of stuff going on there as well. You know, th that is absolutely a great point. Um, in, in a lot of the places around the U.S., we are having some a lot of issues, especially on the uh, West Coast and stuff about water. So who would have guessed the Mississippi dries up? You know, that, oops. You know, how do you forecast that in Inveris? Does Inveris have a little forecast for weather <laughs> because you guys have everything else i i mean we try our best on the natural gas side to know a little bit about the weather but we don't we don't broadly track anything that's for sure you know one of the things that i just really enjoy in visiting is i don't think there's another company out there that has everything from uh software for managing from me uh you know, consumer electric grid operators to oil and gas to, I mean, it's just across the word energy and Veros has great solutions on that. Yeah. We, you know, we try our best to provide value to every, every, you know, possible step along the energy supply chain you can think of. And, you know, we definitely pride ourselves on being able to do that and help producers and, you know, all the people that benefit from the industry. All right. You got a, a last word coming up here, but what's next for Carson personally? What's coming around the corner for you? Uh, right now, I'm looking a lot into electric vehicles. That's kind of my, it's been my week the last couple of oh, weeks here. So nice. enjoying that. And hopefully, you know, we'll have a report about that next year or something like that to talk about with you again. So well, that'll be, uh, that'll be that'll lots be, of fun. That is an interesting area. And, uh, you know, if you don't mind looking into this and then if you've run across it, um, it just seems to me, and I, um, going electric doesn't seem all that good right now, because this is just my unprofessional opinion, but I'll tell you, I love the uh, hybrid cars. It just seems like it seems to have less batteries, and you can run down the road a lot farther with, you know, a little bit. The hybrid right now with the technology makes sense to me. I don't know why everybody's not going nuts over hybrid. Let's use those to get us by. But uh, yeah, I no, uh, I, I think I agree that the hybrids are really cool. Um, 
the biggest limiting factor on EVs, you know, has and is going to be at least for the next couple of years still range. Right. Um, there's a couple there's a couple that are, you know, kind of defying that trend. Some of some of the Teslas have, you know, 500 mile range, which is pretty much, you know, all you all you could ask for. Right. But, um, but a lot of that. Uh, yeah, no, there are a lot. Yeah, there are a lot of money, you know, more of the affordable, the affordable city ones are in like the two, two to 300 range for right miles on a, on a charge. So it, yeah, you know, that'll be one thing that'll be interesting to follow to see if they can improve the battery efficiency and the battery size for, but you know, to and, in those cars going forwards. And I'm excited to see uh, Caterpillar. And as you get more into this, I want to follow up with you because I'm excited to learn this. Caterpillar just had a a coal mining dump truck go EV. I'm like, holy smoke. I can't even imagine the size of the batteries on that bad dog. Yeah, I, I haven't heard about that all that at all, but it sounds that sounds really cool. I would I would love to. I'm gonna Google it after this call. So oh I'm, I'll shoot you the link as well too. I mean it it's absolutely a hoot. Think about the batteries on that thing. Yeah. Yeah they gotta be pretty intense. Does it take a year to charge up? I don't know. I mean, it it, it has caterp- It's a caterpillar. I mean, caterpillar is a good brand. So yeah, no, those yeah, they make good stuff. So I, I would imagine it's probably it's probably pretty cool. Oh, absolutely. And and again, thank you for stopping by the podcast today. I do appreciate you. No worries. It was my total pleasure. All right. Thanks. Thanks.